Good morning. Welcome to Smithfield United Church of Christ. Uh, we are so glad that you have joined us for worship this morning. Uh, whether this is your first time here or whether this is your church of decade upon decade, know that you are deeply welcome in this place and that you are part of the family of God this morning. I'm Liddy Barlow. I am here pinch hitting for our senior pastor, Shannon Garrett Daigie, who's enjoying a couple weeks of vacation and is actually preaching herself this morning at her home congregation in Cleveland, where she grew up. So um, it's great for her to have that opportunity, and um, I'm happy to be with you. We also have a substitute organist this morning, organist, pianist, general musician, jack of all trades. Um, we are super delighted to have Eva Rainsworth with us. Um, she might look familiar, she's an occasional um, member of our choir, she is a friend of Jeff Gross's, um, she teaches voice at Quick Park University, and it's a, it's a delight to have you here. Thank you so much for coming to fill in. You will see a couple of announcements in your bulletin, um, and perhaps the most important is our uh, next weekend is the event called Doors Open Pittsburgh. Um, this is an opportunity for people to visit all of the different architectural and intriguing landmarks of downtown. And our church is a long time stop on the Doors Open tour. John Coburn, raise your hand, John, is organizing volunteers for Doors Open, but John is not going to be here for Doors Open because he will be celebrating his dad's 100th birthday. So, we, that's right, right? No. No. That's not until August. Oh, that's not until August. You're going to just be doing some anticipatory celebrating. I mean, when you're that close, you should just celebrate every weekend. Um, okay, John's not, not he's just not going to be in town, so we need more volunteers for Doors Open. Um, John, how many more volunteers do we need? I would like three. Three more volunteers. So, please give a thought as to whether you would like to hang out here in the sanctuary next weekend and tell people about this beautiful space. We have brochures and information for you to have. You don't have to just make up stories about the architecture yourself. We can provide some details. Um, if you'd like to do that, maybe it would be fun. Um, so please see John if you can fill in next weekend for Doors Open. And then there's one other announcement today, um, and that is that our brother Tom Blazina died on Thursday. And um, those of, of you who spend time in this space know how empty the sanctuary feels, how weird it is to gather for worship without Tom here. Um, his family is organizing a memorial service to take place at Emma's Lounge in Rankin at 1 o'clock on Saturday, June 29th. Uh, and this morning, the uh, purple candle on the altar is burning in Tom's memory. I'd like to share a few words about Tom from uh, our last senior pastor, Doug Patterson, who knew him well. Doug writes, In my 47 years of active ministry, 25 of those at Smithfield, I never had a parishioner as faithful as Tom. From the day he started attending our church some 26 years ago, he only missed one Sunday. He had to miss that day because of a family baptism somewhere. He started apologizing to me at least two months in advance of that missed Sunday, explaining why he was going to be absent. And he apologized to me many times over the next couple of years as to why he wasn't there. He believed that if you were going to be a church member, you had an obligation to attend. He had great respect for the sanctuary, the worship services, and the clergy. He always called me Reverend Patterson, never by my first name, and he treated other clergy the same way. Likewise, he always wore a coat and tie to church. Even when the sanctuary was unbearably hot, he would never remove his jacket. Tom loved the color purple and wore a purple shirt every Sunday. I think he told me once that he had over 50 purple shirts in his closet. The only exception was the one Sunday a year he would wear red, and that was always Pentecost Sunday when the liturgical color is red. Tom was the first person anyone would see on Sundays, as he always passed out the bulletins. He served as our coordinating usher, counted the offering after service, signed checks throughout the week, and gave tours of the building to our numerous visitors. For many years, he served as a lay delegate to association and conference meetings. 
He always wore coat and tie to annual meeting and never missed a session or workshop. His dedication was stellar. He was exceedingly particular, sometimes irritatingly so. If I instructed the congregation to sing only two out of the four verses to a hymn, he would let me know that he didn't think that was right. He wanted to sing every word to every hymn and anything else he found sacrilegious. And he loved to sing with great exuberance, even though he couldn't carry a tune. His humor was somewhat wry, and his loud, cackling laughter was contagious. Tom was the most dedicated, consistent, and faithful church member I have ever known, Doug writes, and I, for one, will miss him. Friends, can we come together in a time of prayer? O oh God of grace and glory, we remember before you our brother Tom. We thank you for giving him to us, his Smithfield United Church of Christ family, to know and to love as a companion on our earthly pilgrimage. We thank you for his commitment to this church, for all the ways he offered himself in service and leadership, and for his irreplaceable personality and spirit. We thank you that for Tom, all grief, suffering, and death itself are past, and that he has now entered the home where all your people gather in peace. Draw us ever closer to you, that we may know that we are all nearer to our loved ones who are with you. Give us faith to trust in your promises, and assure us again that the ear has not heard, nor eye seen, nor human imagination and vision what you have prepared for those who love you. Through Jesus Christ, the firstborn from the dead. Amen. Friends, will we stand to call ourselves to worship? The kingdom of God is like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of seeds on earth. It grows up and becomes the greatest of shrubs, and the birds of the air make nests in its shade. Give thanks to God, whose promised rain is coming. Thanks be to God. Our first hymn is number 256, We Live by Faith and Not by Sight.
trusting God's power to make us new persons in Christ, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Holy God, the parable of the mustard seed teaches us that a little faith can produce great work in your kingdom. Yet we are too timid to bear the fruit of your righteousness, for we walk by sight and not by faith. Forgive us, Lord. We do not uphold the poor or the oppressed. We do not advocate for the powerless or the voiceless. We do not sacrifice ourselves for the needs of our neighbors. Renew us with the love of Christ, that we live no longer for ourselves, but for Christ, who became the seed of righteousness in us. Amen.
Gospel reading is from Mark 4, 26 to 34. He also said, The kingdom of God is as if someone would scatter seed on the ground, and would sleep and rise night and day, and the seed would sprout and grow. He does not know how. The earth produces of itself first the stalk, then the head, then the full grain in the head. But when the grain is ripe at once, he goes in with his sickle, because the harvest has come. He also said, With what can we compare the kingdom of God, or what parable will we use for it? It is like a mustard seed, which, when sown upon the ground, is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. Yet, when it is sown, it grows up and becomes the greatest of all shrubs, and puts forth large branches, so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. With many such parables he spoke the word to them, as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them except in parables, but he explained everything in private to his disciples. The word of the Lord. Friends, would you pray with me? Gracious God, nurturer of all growth, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sights. Amen. The tasseled caps tossed in the air, the strains of pomp and circumstance, the eager young people crossing the stage. This is graduation season. Over the past few weeks, everyone from preschoolers to PhDs has come to the end of their programs, and their schools took a moment to step back and celebrate. And with that pause comes the realization that our little ones are not so little any longer, that these graduates of whatever age have learned and matured, that they are now more than they were when they started. And whether you have been watching children grow day by day or week by week, or whether you are just now catching a glimpse of a distant relative's kid in cap and gown on social media, your reaction in this season might be the same. How did they get so big? They've grown so much. How did that happen? And look, we know how kids grow. We keep feeding them, they keep getting bigger. We have seen video in science classes of cells multiplying under a microscope. We understand how things grow according to biology. And we get how people might learn and mature as well. Their school curricula are designed to bring them step by step to greater knowledge. We understand how things grow according to educational theory. But on some deeper level, growth still manages to catch us by surprise. There's something about it that catches us unaware and is hard to explain. How did they get so big? Jesus said, The kingdom of God is as if someone would scatter seed on the ground and would sleep and rise night and day, and the seed would sprout and grow, and he doesn't know how. He doesn't know how. The kingdom of God is as if the farmer goes out to his field and says, How did you get so big? to a row of rising corn stalks. Now, the farmer is in the growing business. He knows how things grow. He knows how the soil and the rain and the sun affect the crops. But even so, there is something mysterious, something outside of his power in the midst of this process. It's like that old children's song, remember? First the farmer plants the seed, then he stands and takes his ease. Stamps his foot and claps his hand and turns around to view his land. Oats and beans and barley grow, oats and beans and barley grow. 
Can you or I or anyone know how oats and beans and barley grow? Well, the farmer is just standing there, taking his ease. The crops are growing, and he does not know how. Or maybe it's even more than that. Jesus doesn't actually say that he's talking about a farmer at all. The word here is an anthropos, a person, the root of our word anthropology. It's just someone, a guy. The kingdom of God is as if some random person scattered seeds. This is not actually a story about a crop planted in tidy rows that have been carefully proud, plowed and prepared. The word is scatter. It's not sow or plant. It's as if someone just casually tossed a handful of seeds out the window and overnight a beanstalk grew straight up to the sky. It's as if someone threw an apple core out the window of a moving car and years later an orchard grew all along the highway. Jesus says here that the earth produces of itself. The word in Greek is automate. It's almost the same word as our word automatic, automatically. That's how things grow. Once that seeding process is in motion, the rest happens naturally without any intervention required. So the kingdom of God is as if things grow when our backs are turned. Seeds, children, faith, relationships. Some things we might have carefully planted and nurtured, but others we might not even have realized we were planting at all. We sleep and rise, we go about our daily lives, and things just grow, and we do not know how. I heard Bishop Elizabeth Eaton who is the presiding bishop of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, speak once about Martin Luther's small catechism. It's the short book explaining what Christians believe that Luther wrote for children and for other newcomers to the church. Bishop Eaton drew our attention to what Luther wrote about the third article of the Apostles' Creed, the part that goes, I believe in the Holy Ghost, in one holy Catholic church, the communion of saints, forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. What does this mean? The Catechism asks. And Luther replies, I believe that I cannot by my own reason or strength believe in Jesus Christ my Lord, or come to him, but that the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, sanctified and kept me in the true faith. Bishop Eaton drew our attention to these first words of Luther's response. I cannot, by my own reason or strength, believe in Jesus Christ my Lord. That is un-American, Bishop Eaton said, but it is the truth. We want to think in our culture that we have the power to make change, to get things done. We want to believe in our own bootstraps and in what happens when we pull up on them. We buy books about how to raise our children right, how to grow our businesses right, how to grow our churches right. But Luther said some things, even something as deeply personal as what we believe, some things we cannot do by our own effort. Some things are simply not our doing. We sleep and we wake, and God makes them happen, and we do not know how. They don't happen because of our own reason or strength, our own careful planning, or our own virtuous hard work. Some things God does in us and around us without us doing a single thing to make them happen. And I think this comes as good news to us in this moment at Smithfield United Church of Christ. Because while we are fretting about how to restore and sustain and grow our church, while we are piling up a stack of books on church growth, and there are enough of those to construct an entire church out of, <laughs> this parable reminds us who grows the church. The Apostle Paul echoed this metaphor when he was responding to the quarreling congregation at the church in Corinth. Some of its members said that they belonged to Paul's church and others to his colleague Apollos' church. 
But Paul said these were not two separate churches at all, defined by their leaders. Instead, he wrote, I planted and Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. What grows is God's doing. In God's kingdom, we don't have to force things to happen all by themselves. We are just to toss some seeds out of the window because it is God who makes them grow. And that means that our fretful anxiety can be replaced by watchful expectation. Turn around and view the land. Stand and take your ease and look to see how God is providing growth, even in this season that might seem foul. Wonder at how God might be growing seedlings of faith inside of you. How God might be nurturing new relationships and lifting up new gifts within and beyond this church. How we might right now be seated in a greenhouse that was not of our own making, ready to unfurl our leaves and to bear fruit when the season is right. Instead of pushing forward to make things happen, step back and notice how things are happening by God's hand and in God's time instead of in ours. Martin Luther knew this not only in his catechism, but also in his life. In the year 1522, he preached a sermon reflecting on how the Protestant Reformation had come to be. He said, I simply taught and preached and wrote God's word. Otherwise, I did nothing. And while I slept, or drank Wittenberg beer with my friends Philip and Amsdorf, the word so greatly weakened the papacy that no prince or emperor ever inflicted such losses on it. I did nothing. The word did everything. Now, if we look more closely at Luther's words here, it's not that he did nothing. Exactly. It's not like he was day and night out boozing with his theological buddies. He was, by his own admission, teaching and preaching and writing all along. And similarly, in the parable, the person who scatters seeds has some work to do. When the grain is ripe, Jesus says, at once he goes in with his sickle because the harvest has come. In other words, all along, we can keep throwing seeds. We can keep harvesting. We can be actively engaged in the work of God's kingdom. But we know that we don't do it all by ourselves. There's a wonderful reflection that is often attributed to the martyred Archbishop Oscar Romero. It was actually written by a Catholic bishop in Michigan named Ken Unterer that expresses the same theme. It goes like this. He writes, it helps now and then to step back and take a long view. The kingdom is not only beyond our efforts, it is even beyond our vision. We accomplish in our lifetime only a tiny fraction of the magnificent enterprise that is God's work. Nothing we do is complete, which is a way of saying that the kingdom always lies beyond us. No statement says all that could be said, no prayer fully expresses our faith. No confession brings perfection. No pastoral visit brings wholeness. No program accomplishes the church's mission. No set of goals and objectives includes everything. This is what we are about. We plant the seeds that will one day grow. We water seeds already planted knowing that they hold future promise. We lay foundations that will need further development. We provide yeast that produces far beyond our capabilities. We cannot do everything, and there is a sense of liberation in realizing that. This enables us to do something, and to do it very well. It may be incomplete, but it is a beginning, a step along the way, an opportunity for the Lord's grace to enter and do the rest. We may never see the end results, but that is the difference between the master builder and the worker. We are workers, not master builders, ministers and not messiahs. We are prophets of a future that is not our own.
We already see evidence of that future right in the world around us. We watch our kids growing. We watch our love expanding. We watch our faith deepening. We see evidence of the growth, even as we recognize that growth is yet incomplete. And we take hold of our own sins, knowing that we do not hold them alone. Friends, stand back and take your ease, because it is God who provides the growth. Thanks be to God. Let us come together in prayer. Lord of seed time and of harvest, we give you thanks for the ways that you are at work when our backs are turned. When we are sleeping, when we are waking, you are nurturing greenness and growth in this world around us. You have taken seeds we were unaware we planted and brought them into beautiful blossoms. As we offer our gratitude, we pray also for the wisdom to see that growth at work and to come alongside it, ready for the harvest. On this Father's Day, we give thanks for all who have been fathers to us. We remember our own dads in all their goodness and in all their weaknesses. We thank them for the gift of life itself. We give thanks for all people who have acted in fatherly ways towards us, mentoring us and shaping us and telling us terrible jokes. We give thanks for the ways that you, God, were known to Jesus as a father and the ways that your fatherly affection can be available to us as well. As we prepare for Juneteenth, we thank you, God, for all the ways that you bring more freedom and more liberation to our lives. We give thanks especially for the deep resilience of our African-American brothers and sisters, for the ways that from deepest oppression, they have risen to such leadership such lightness in our society. We are thankful for the ways that we together can celebrate liberation. And we pray that such liberation might come to all your children across the world. We pray this week for everyone affected by the excessive heat, especially for our brothers and sisters without homes. We pray for those neighbors who were affected by the fire at Second Avenue Commons and who are still in need of stable housing two weeks later. We pray that you might keep all of us safe in this heat wave and that you might help us attend to the causes of climate change so that we can preserve this earth that you made. Our prayers stretch around this whole troubled world. We pray for all people in places of war and conflict, especially for the people in Gaza and in Ukraine. We pray for people in conflicts that stay outside of our headlines, like those in Sudan and Burkina Faso. We pray for all for whom violence is a daily reality here in our city and in places like ours across this country. Help all of us to be people of peace, people of reconciliation, people of fresh opportunities and of hope. We pray for everyone this morning who is in special need of your healing care, for all those who are facing surgeries or sudden illnesses, for those coping with lasting chronic conditions. We pray that you, great physician, might come eagerly to their side and offer them healing and hope. And we pray for all people who mourn. We pray especially for the family and friends of Tom Lazina and of Betty Keebler and other beloved saints of this church. And for all who are mourning recent losses 
or remembering those whose loss is more distant but still keenly felt. For all these prayers we have named and for the many that remain on our hearts, we trust that you are listening, O oh God. We trust that you will help us to be your hands and feet, to answer one another's prayers in this world, and that through your strong power and everlasting love, you too might not only hear our prayers, but also respond. We pray in Jesus' name, and we pray as he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, and as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. God has provided us with all that we need. It is our privilege to give back to God. Let us return a portion of what God has so freely given to us, and let us now humbly bring our gifts to the Lord.
all around you. There are little green shoots budding up deep within, here among us, across the world. The world is bursting into life. And we do not know how. And that's okay. Because God, who is creator and redeemer and sustainer, is alive and at work and is blessing us always. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. Amen.